Are we good to go? Yeah. Okay, brilliant. So, comrades, friends, fellow workers, members of the British working class who are joining us online. It's fantastic to be with you again. As you know, this is the launch meeting. Is that too loud? Are you okay? It's the launch meeting of the Workers' Party of Britain. We've had a fantastic morning. Um, those of you who were with us would have heard Joti's opening remarks, which were very powerful. And George, we expect nothing less than you to be very powerful. And you did not disappoint. It's a very exciting time to be a part of this movement. The collapse of the Corbyn project within Labour has given many members of the working class pause for thought. There's a lot of soul searching. A lot of people are very disappointed. Millions of people who have not only considered themselves Labour Party, but have considered their families Labour Party, their areas Labour Party. They didn't question that that was an inherent part of their working class identity, have gone against that in order to make sure that Brexit was achieved. Brexit that they voted for against the advice of US presidents, British presidents, bankers, magnates of industry, committees of small industry, every received wisdom and opinion told the British workers they had to vote in a certain way. And yet the British workers said that's not in our interest. And they did it for a variety of reasons coming from a variety of angles. But it was a real, it was one in the eye of the British establishment. And the last three, four years of our political life has been dedicated to making sure that that has happened. But now, Boris Johnson is very convinced that he can maintain that. He, he feels generally it's his personal attribute that all these workers from the Red Wall have voted for him. They voted despite themselves for him, but they're looking for a new home. And we very much hope that this party will be the home of the British working class. And we want to address the issues that are central and most important to the British working class. Perhaps I should introduce myself. I'm not a widely known figure. My name is Ranjit Bra. I'm a surgeon um, by profession, by trade. I work within the National Health Service. And I've worked there, I guess I went to medical school in 1997. So you could say I've been working in that capacity and since throughout my professional life for over 20 years in the National Health Service. And even in my lifetime, I've seen a huge change in the National Health Service. Um, there's constant, every government seems to redesign targets, redesign performance uh, goals, redefine a strategic direction. And yet, with every redevelopment, we've seen an increasing level of chaos on the front line. People who work on the front line of the NHS will tell you how frustrating it is to struggle against the managerial framework and system, the overall climate of funding shortfall to try and provide excellent care. It's our mantra, we live by it. We want to provide excellent care because we also are the beneficiaries of that care. It's a system that means a tremendous amount to working people. You don't have to go very far back within the living memory of, when I first went to work in the NHS, my patients were those people. 70, 80 year old, 90 year old patients were so grateful for the care they received. It was humbling to treat them. It was an honor to treat them. We could do no wrong in their eyes because they remembered the time before the NHS. George was telling us he was born in a tenement flat in a slum in Glasgow. You know, I was born in the NHS hospital. My children are born in NHS hospitals. But my parents were not, and their generation were not. There are stories if you go back and look at those pre-NHS hospital uh, uh, GPs, general practitioners, where they would visit a sick child, the parents couldn't afford to pay, and so as not to embarrass not to embarrass the parents of the child. The doctor would, it was a, a gentleman thing to do, you'd casually leave your gloves on the dresser and forget to take them with you. So you had an excuse to go and pick up your gloves later from the child in the sick house. And while you were there, you could follow up on your patients and see that they were all right. It was this kind of individual acts of charity that the working class depended on for their bread and butter care. We take it for granted now that we should receive care. But actually, the National Health Service was dragged from an unwilling ruling class. 
It was dragged from an unwilling willing ruling class and given to working people, not by active charity, but because of the struggle of the working class to win it. They won it through their trade union actions. They won it when they came back from the Second World War by demanding, by demanding that they had the right to live like human beings, that they would never fight again for a system that would not take care of them. And there were overwhelming examples in the Soviet Union, as George was saying, throughout the world, of workers being able to provide decent life for themselves. And it was in that context that we won the National Health Service. But when I came recently, there was a, there was a strike of junior doctors when their contract was being altered. At that point, Jeremy Hunt was an absolute hate figure for workers in the NHS, because he was quite clearly downgrading the paying conditions of workers within it and downgrading the service. But you know, the interesting thing is that Jeremy Hunt wasn't even in charge of the NHS at that point, and his post assessor. Now, does anyone even know who the Secretary of Health is? These nameless, faceless Tory MPs. Oh. Hancock? Yeah, so it's Matt Hancock. Yeah, so Matt Hancock is allegedly in charge of our health service. But it's not true. You know, the actual running of our health service has been passed over to a quango. Simon Stevens, who is still the chief executive of the NHS in England. So an unelected person runs it, and that man's history is not known. He's not an elected politician, but actually he's a place man of the massive insurance industry. He was key in Tony Blair putting in place PFI, a key plank of the Labour Party's privatisation of the NHS. And now he's back, and his gender that we're going to hear from our main speaker at this event is very much the continuation of that privatisation. It's going to have a real and lasting impact. The NHS has become a political football. Every single person from every party, no matter what they're trying to achieve, will appeal to the British love of their health service. But we're going to learn today from Bob, um, and perhaps I should say a few words about Bob, the real state of the NHS. Bob Gill is a GP from South London. He initially started campaigning, and he'll probably tell you in his own words when I started campaigning, but he started campaigning around issues he was having with the closure of his local hospital. And as he became more and more drawn into that fight and struggle, he became more and more aware of a very joined up, very real conspiracy to fully privatise and run down our health service. And I think, without saying much more, I'm going to hand over to Bob, because he'll tell that story in his own words and very powerfully. And it'll give you a good idea of the real obstacles we're facing. They're very joined up obstacles. Both Tory Party and Labour Party have collaborated over the last 40 years to put in place a framework and process which is leading to the decline of our NHS. And we want to talk about that process and then what we can do effectively to oppose it. But I think it is very, very much entwined with the formation of this political group. Because what you'll find is, and I've been involved in many NHS campaigns, as I've been involved in anti-war campaigns, campaigns to stop the withdrawal of social services, and what you find is at a certain level, the Labour Party is very much involved with the leadership of those campaigns. They're interested in them in as much as they become a vehicle for electoral politics building up towards, as the junior doctor strike, the demands that the leaders wanted to put forward was vote Corbyn and everything would change. And that's their ultimate aim. What they're not interested in is organising working people for a grassroots campaign or struggle. And this, I think, is where the NHS campaign has to be dovetailed in with the formation of, really, organisation of working people who are prepared to put their rights and interests first. And I hope that the Workers' Party will play that role. So I'm going to hand over to Bob who will tell you his own story. Bob Gill, thank you. Thank you, thank you Randy. Thank you Workers' Party of Britain for inviting me along today. How long have I got, Randy? Uh, an hour, or 45 minutes, thank you. So, yeah, thank you for inviting me. Um, thank you particularly to George Galloway and Dietry for supporting a lot of 
the efforts I've been putting in to try and get the word out about the NHS. What, what I want to do in the 45 minutes or so is to give you a background of how we got to where we are and also a firm understanding of how we're going to end up with the dysfunctional, corrupt, twice as expensive and worse performing US healthcare system. Is there anybody in this room who doubts that is the intended direction of travel? If you do, put your hand up. All right. My work's going to be easy today, so you already know. There was some discussion earlier about when did all this start? Um, I had a feeling during my early training, I qualified as a doctor from Sheffield in 1993. I'll go back a little bit further. I was born in Birmingham, uh, Dudley Road Hospital. I don't know if that's still standing. I'm the son of immigrants. Uh, my grandfather was in the British Army, then worked in the steel foundries in Birmingham, and then went on to work for British Gypsum in Nottingham. So very hard, labour-intensive work. And something, something that was drummed into us very early on was, compared to the village they came from, the UK in the 60s and 70s was like heaven on earth. Why? Obviously the lovely people here, that was one factor, but the welfare state. You had access to health care, you had free education, you could go to university and get a grant to go and come out without a single penny's worth of debt. What's not to like? And it was also clear you need to make the most of these opportunities. And there was a structure, a social fabric, where people from very humble beginnings could progress in this country. But that has been steadily dismantled since 1979, I think as George said. There has been a 40-year programme to remove all the rights and protections and civil services and social services that the country paid a very heavy price for in two world wars. Most of that has disappeared, or is disappearing fast. Margaret Thatcher, another chap you should know, Oliver Lettwin. Do people know that name? Oliver Lettwin and his colleague uh, John Redwood were the brains behind the privatisation of our utilities, our public services and the NHS. And this is what I'm going to show you. Hopefully you can see it's not that clear over there. But this is a, an extract from an Oliver Lettwin document called Britain's Biggest Enterprise from 1988 where he sets out how he's going to change the NHS from a public service to an insurance-based service. Now this is part of, um, it's not very clear, I'll, I'll highlight the points in a minute. How I've come to my current understanding has been through personal experience seeing uh, the ethos of the NHS gradually decline and also seeing the services available to my patients shrinking. And it took um, the Health and Social Care Act 2012 to really wake me up to what's going on. And it came to a point whereby I was seeing sick patients I admitted to hospital coming home sicker than when I'd sent them in. Now that should not happen. It may happen once, but it was happening on a routine basis. And that's because we suffered the downgrading and loss of a major hospital down the road, Queen Mary's Hospital, Sitka. So that's what galvanised me to act. And Part of that action was to join the local campaign group, to become active for the first time in my life, to see the workings of the Labour Party, the good and the bad, and also how campaign groups can be diverted and subverted. But along that journey I met a lot of good people and not so good people, but I've learned a lot. And this was part of my learning. What lettering sets out, most of which has already been achieved. Independent trusts, breaking the NHS from a unified public service into loads of independent 
standalone, almost business entities called foundation trusts. These are the hospital trusts. And also primary care GP services were broken up into primary care trusts. So you start to break it up. Why is that important? It's very hard to, to privatise the NHS because it's so big and there's no corporation on earth that could take on the whole enterprise in one big step. And the other problem with it is people might notice. Because the NHS is rightly beloved by the public, so to do it in an overt way would be politically disastrous. So they knew they had to set about this over two or three decades at least. Joint ventures, well, what that means is public-private partnerships. Have we all heard of public-private partnerships? The public borrow expensively from private financial institutions and sadly NHS with debt. That's one example of a public-private partnership. Extending the principle of charging. Patient charges, how do you do that? First you establish an infrastructure by blaming immigrants and health talk of using for everybody. So the people who were attracted to the headlines about we're going to stamp down hard on health tourism, the amount of money they're trying to recoup is less than 1%. But the infrastructure cost of introducing a charging and billing system grossly outweighs the revenue that they're claiming to try and recoup. So why do it? It's complete madness on those arguments. It's only when you understand the true intention that the charges will be extended to everybody. <coughs> health credits. They're introducing also at the moment something called personal health budgets. In due course, these budgets will be transferable. You will be able to take your NHS budget and hand it over to a private insurer and then top that up. And then finally, you'll have the equivalent of the American Medicare and Medicaid, whereby you'll have a basic entitlement under the NHS, and anything extra, you'll have to take out top-up insurance. So, so Ledwin set out his intentions quite helpfully very early on. What have we seen happening ever since? We've had a policy continuum from 79 to the present day, we've had the same political policy with slightly different jargon. From 97 to 2010, we had socialist sounding jargon, but the reality was in the NHS, the policies further advanced the privatization. So I mentioned private finance initiative. To build needed hospitals, the government, Blair and Brown, borrowed 11 billion pounds. Do you know how much the public have to pay back on 11 billion? 88 billion. Now would you borrow a mortgage from a bank and pay back eight times your original borrowing? Hands up. To borrow a phrase, I've got a bridge I'd like to send you. <laughs> if you're putting your hands up to that one. What's worse is we don't own the hospital after the term of the mortgage. Can you imagine your mortgage, you've paid off your mortgage and the bank comes and says, hand over the keys. It's our, it's our house. That's what Tony Blair and Gordon Brown signed us up to with PFI. What else did they do? Leading up to Blair's administration, we already had the splitting up of the NHS workforce, the cleaning, the catering, the portrait, they all were outsourced. But for the first time in the early 2000s, clinical care was starting to be outsourced. Independent treatment centres. So private operators were given a very generous payment to come and cream off the easy work out of the NHS and generate a profit. And they were paid for work that they didn't even perform. Now, who wouldn't mind a contract like that? Very generous indeed. And by doing that, by cherry picking, they left all the complicated, expensive patients with the NHS, without the funding and the cross subsidy that used to occur when you looked after the whole patient group. So that was a deliberate 
destabilization of the NHS by sucking out the profitable work. And that has expanded exponentially ever since. The other thing that Tony Blair did, which is key and is replicated across all public services, is to disconnect power from responsibility. You used to have an NHS with a small board who were predominantly clinically led doctors and nurses with experience making decisions on behalf of the population. Now we have bloat of bureaucracies who never see a patient, care even less about the patient, and impose policy directly from Downing Street, the Department of Health, onto the front line, and the doctors and nurses are absolutely powerless to alter what goes on. And this is how cuts and closures are rammed through despite the obvious safety implications. And this continued under Blair. And then we got to the 2012 Health and Social Care Act. After Cameron promised in 2010 no more top-down reorganisations, we had the biggest top-down reorganisation since 1948. And what that act achieved was to, by law, force every service within the NHS to be contracted out to the private sector. Now that's a big deal. How was this presented on the BBC News? They're giving control to the front line. 30 seconds on the BBC News, and then they cut to something even more important, which is the breakup of the boy band JLS. Because you didn't need to know anymore. Randy alluded to this earlier. At that, the action of the 2012 Act also removed the responsibility in law to provide an NHS. The NHS was effectively abolished in law. There is no legal duty now for the Secretary of State to provide health services. His legal duty now is to promote them, to be an advertising agent. And the power to run the NHS transferred to the guy we heard about, Simon Stevens. So when the Labour Shadow Health stands in Westminster trying to hold Jeremy Hunt or Matt Hancock to account, that's a complete charade because the power has gone elsewhere. And in fact, I spoke to Jonathan Ashworth, who is the Shadow Health Secretary, about why is he holding the monkey to account when the organ grind is in a different building. He said, well, that's my job. That's all I'm going to do. I said, do you not think there's a public interest in informing everybody that the power has transferred away from Parliament? The power actually resides in the United States, at the headquarters of United Health, who are driving all our policy in this country through their former president of global expansion, Simon Stevens. Let me say that again. The current chief executive of NHS England was president for global expansion for United Health, America's biggest insurer. Now, why was that key bit of information not in every Labour Party propaganda throughout the election campaign? I think it's pretty strong. Does anybody disagree that that might be a strong point to ram on? What we had was a bit of a stage show about some leaked document. That is minor compared to the organisational and structural changes that are taking place within the NHS as we speak. If you're not worried about the American takeover of our healthcare, well let me give you a bit of background. What you see on screen now is a current action in the US courts whereby United Health is being taken to court by the government for defrauding their publicly funded system to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars. They were devising computer algorithms which would skim away money without delivering any care. These are the people we're handling control over of the NHS, United Health. I would argue another term that should be on the tip of everybody's tongue is United Health. 
because they are driving the bus on this one. Why else should we be worried? Well, operators like Health Corporation of America have more or less cornered the market of private provision in the NHS in, sorry, in London. They have partnered up with the NHS. If you go to Guy's Hospital near London Bridge, in the bottom of the chart is a glossy, gleaming offices of Unite of Health Corporation of America. Within the buildings of UCL, there's a whole so that people who are refused care on the NHS for their cancer only have to go up one floor with their checkbook and top up the treatment. That is happening now. So they're already here. But did you hear any of this in the run up to the last election? So the company I mentioned earlier, and this is a bit we might need the sound for. If you do one thing after this meeting is please look up the documentary, two things, look up my documentary, but this other one is quite good, called Sicko by Michael Moore, made in 2007. And when I watched it, I was shocked because the film is not about the uninsured and the poor. The film is about the insured Americans and how they are routinely fleeced and dumped when they get sick. So the clip I want to play now is from Sicko, and then I'll discuss it uh, afterwards. Hopefully we've got the sound on this. There was one person in the healthcare industry who did have conscience. Dr. Linda Pino, a former medical reviewer at Humana. My name is Linda Pino. I'm here primarily today to make a public confession. Uh, in the spring of 1987, as a physician, I denied the unnecessary operation that would have saved his life and thus cost him death. No person and no group held me accountable for this, because in fact, what I did was I saved a company I had to find a dollar for. And furthermore, this particular act secured my reputation as a good medical director, and it ensured my continued advancement in the healthcare field. Uh, I went from making a few hundred dollars a week as a medical reviewer to an escalating six-figure income as a physician in sick. In all my work, I had one primary duty, and that was to use my medical expertise for the financial benefit of the organization in which I worked. And I was told repeatedly that I was not denying care, I was simply denying pain. I know how managed care maims and kills patients. So I'm here to tell you about the dirty work of managed care. And I'm haunted by the vast pieces of paper in which I have written a deadly word, denied. Thank you. How did we get to the point that doctors and health insurance companies actually being responsible for the deaths of patients. Who invented this system? How did this all begin? Where did the HMO start?
The plan hatched between Nixon and Edgar Kaiser worked. In the ensuing years, patients were given less and less care. Bigger logs in the nearby public hospital and less quality medical care. Been in by 18 hours. What looks cramped and unsightly can also be dangerous. While the health insurance companies became wealthy, the system was broken. 37 million Americans are without protection against catastrophic illness. The losers are the poor, who may now postpone urgently needed health care until it's too late. This went on for years. Was one person in the healthcare industry? So, the key points out of that clip. Number one, the less care you give them, the more money you make. Did everybody pick up on that sentence? That's how insurance works. Profit is made not by looking after the patient, it's by denying them care wherever possible, by, by whatever means possible. So am I just scaremongering or being sensitive as I was accused of being by my local clinical commissioning chair, former MP Howard Stoke, who when I told him about the worries I had, said, your patients are just unlucky, nobody else is telling me this, you're a bit too sensitive, don't worry, you're not paying for it. That's what radicalised me. If this is the attitude of our local leaders, maybe I need to speak up. Am I exaggerating? The evidence is mounting that what we're seeing, the combination of these policies with austerity and the cuts to social care, is actually killing off the sick and the poor. There's no other way to put it. And this is deliberate. If you cut funding, people are going to die. You don't need to do the, the research is out there, the evidence is out there. And you mentioned Greece. That's had the biggest austerity package imposed on them by the Troika, the EU, um, European Bank, which has killed off thousands of people. Suicide rates gone through the roof. Miscarriage rates gone up. Depression is endemic. What's happening in this country? Research was published showing 120,000 excess deaths have occurred since 2010. Our governments have killed off more of the public than any overseas terrorism threat since the Second World War. The most dangerous people to this country are the people running. expectancy. In every other equivalent economy, life expectancy continues to slowly grow, grow, get higher, get longer. People are living longer. In this country, research has shown that if you're over 65, life expectancy has dropped by six months since the austerity package. And what's probably the most damning is for the first time since records began, Infant mortality in this country has risen for three years in a row. More children are dying as a result of lack of services, poor care, poor antenatal care, delayed early intervention as a result of government policy. It's not been seen in any equivalent economy. So it's not me being sensitive, Mr. Howard Stowe. This is happening across the country. But it's also happened to patients of mine. The lady on the left, in her 70s, developed back pain, diagnosed with osteoporosis. A couple of weeks later, developed severe pain across her chest, weakness in her legs, and urinary incontinence. Back pain, neurological symptoms. What's the diagnosis, anyone? Spinal cord compression. Her spinal cord is being pressed upon by the fracture. A medical student should be able to tell you that. I had to send her in three times to the local A&E department before she had a scan. The scan was reported as normal. She was sent home. The following morning she was paralysed. 
from the breast down, from the chest down. That's one hospital trust that failed her. She was transferred to King's and had spinal fixation surgery, then transferred back to the first hospital where she languished on a normal ward without any neurophysiotherapy. I went in to see her. I seldom go in to see my patients in hospital, I'm busy enough. I went in to see her, I said, let me fight for you. She said, no, because chair of my patient participation group, to a complete nervous wreck, fearful of her life. Three months pass, she gets transferred to Lewisham Hospital where she gets neuro rehabilitation. But her liver function tests start to go awry and somebody's light bulb goes on. They chase the histology from King's. It turns out she had multiple myeloma, which has not been treated for three months and has progressed. This is a very treatable cancer in her spine. So this is three trusts in South East London that failed this lady. She lasted about another year, then died of a pneumonia. She was bedridden. Preventable, multiple system failure. Any internal inquiry? No. The family pushed and they would lie to. I, were in the, I was in the meetings with the family when the, when the same consultants who told me the MRI was normal lied and said we didn't interpret the MRI, it was King's fault. So you're sent around in a circle. When you're bereaved, you are not in a fit condition to fight a hospital trust. And they rely on most people being fobbed off by life and very few people take it further. Somebody who did take it further is the lady on the right, who I feature in our film. Her daughters took it further. I had referred her to the hospital urgently. She was in her early 80s, I hardly ever saw her, generally fit. She came to me with, uh, we, we routinely tested her blood count and she was severely anemic, a haemoglobin of seven. Half of what it should be, should be 14, 12 plus at least. I call her in, I say, how are you doing? Very stoical lady, it was like, pulling teeth to get out of her, that she was losing weight, her bowel habit was altered, and I knew she was severely anemic. Any diagnosis? Bowel cancer. I refer her urgently on a two-week wait. Now what used to happen when hospitals had these luxury things called hospital beds, is that you would see a person like this who lives on their own, very anemic, frail, and you would admit them from clinic into a bed doesn't happen anymore. They arrange outpatient investigations, none of which get done until three months later she collapses at home. Now why do you think she collapsed? I know I'm testing you and you've had lunch. Why do you think she collapsed? I've told you. Anemia, right? She's still got this cancer, anemia is only going to get worse. She collapses at home, goes to A&E, turned round again. Collapses again, goes to A&E on a Friday. The doctor tells her, I, I need to admit you. Then comes back an hour or so later saying, you're fine, you can go home. See you on Monday, we'll give you a transfusion. She had to be carried by two relatives to the car. She could barely walk on her own. She's anemic. She's losing weight. This is inhumane. This is happening in London and it's happening now. She goes home, stays in bed all weekend, and then collapses out of bed. Suddenly develops intense, severe pain with abdominal distension. Her abdomen bloats out like this, and she's in extreme pain. Diagnosis? You're not allowed, but you're right. <laughs> so she's got, she's got a mass, which is not growing normally, and if you subject abnormal tissue to pressure, trauma, it's going to rip. Yeah? It's not complicated. She goes to A&E, she's seen by a nurse, she's seen by a healthcare assistant, the doctor's rushing around, nobody diagnoses what's going on, her abdomen's distended, she nearly had a cardiac arrest in the ambulance, it's another seven hours before she has a cardiac arrest again, and they finally diagnose her bowel perforation, and then they decide 
well, she's had fecal matter sloshing around in her abdomen. She's septic. There's no point. We won't operate. And she was allowed to die. Her daughters came to me, described what's happened. I said, look, I'm hearing stories like this on a regular basis. If you want me to help you, I'll help you. But don't expect me to push on this, because I've been there before, where I've pushed and pushed and pushed, and the family fall by the wayside. I haven't got the energy to do it, but if you want my support, I'll support you. They were fighters, both daughters, Put a letter together which I helped edit. I wrote a letter, we wrote to the coroner. Two years later we got to the coroner's court. In the meantime, my status and my care with this lady was questioned. I was made a person of interest, that means they can look at my actions, which made me take a deep swallow and then I said, fair enough. Then they removed my person of interest status. The coroner's inquest took place whereby the penny dropped with me that I was not allowed to ask any questions because now I was no longer a person of interest. So imagine the setting. You've got untrained people trying to hold establish the trust lawyers and senior doctors to account. How's that going to go? In the court there was absolutely zero mention of the time of her admission to the seven hours of her arrest. This was airbrushed out. I took the stand to describe what happened. The trust lawyer turns on me and starts interrogating my care before she got to the hospital. But the coroner had set parameters from the day of, from the Friday to her, the day of her death, four days. The parameters were set. But the lawyer was allowed to attack me despite the coroner sitting there and doing nothing. The long and short of it was death by natural causes. The family got upset and the coroner shouted them down. The system is stacked against you folks. There aren't many doctors who will go as far as I have. Why did I go so far? Part of it was anger. Part of it was to see how corrupt everything is. And it's worse than I thought. Lady on the left, mid 50s, presents with sudden onset of jaundice without pain. Middle aged lady, jaundice without pain. I know you're getting a bit of a medical education today. Any diagnosis, not from you. <laughs> Close, pancreatic cancer. It, when you get jaundice, it means your bile duct is blocked, the bile isn't getting through. If it's blocked suddenly by a stone, you get pain. If it's blocked suddenly without pain, it's pancreatic cancer until proven otherwise. What did my local hospital make of her? Viral hepatitis, go home. She came back to us, we had to send her to another hospital where they diagnosed her pancreatic cancer, but she languished on a ward without having a stent to relieve the obstruction for a further 10 days, during the course of which the hospital staff pleaded with her, please make a complaint because we can't say anything. Now George, you talked about the miners strike and the great worker struggles, but well, we have an equally devastating struggle but it's not with police truncheons. It's a psychological warfare fought by the managers against the staff trying to do a decent job. You cannot speak up. There's a culture of fear. If you do raise a concern and you persist, you will lose your career and you'll be managed out. You'll be smeared, you'll be called, called a nutcase, and you may end up languishing for years in the employment tribunal where you've got a three percent chance of success. Any of you would volunteer for that ordeal? I don't think so. And the most recent case, this man lying on the uh, couch in my surgery, sweating buckets, is a cancer patient in his mid-30s, 
who recently had chemotherapy and developed a raging fever and sweats. Chemotherapy, cancer patient, sweating profusely. Any diagnosis? Well done. Who said that? Well done. This is neutropenic sepsis until proven otherwise. This is a medical emergency. He needs to be injected. What do we do? We call for a 999 ambulance. How long does he wait on the couch in our surgery? One hour. One hour in which his organs could switch off, his circulation could collapse, and he could die. Now imagine the pressure on me and my staff with this sick person, and we're helpless to do anything. I don't have that equipment in my surgery. Why should I? The hospital is five minute drive by my car, three minutes by ambulance. What's he doing languishing for an hour in a GP surgery in the fourth, fifth, sixth richest country? So it's happening, it's real, it's facing me every week, even when I want to take a week off campaigning, somebody like that comes into my surgery and then I think, I've got to start again. Yeah? I can't switch off unless I leave. To my wife's dismay. The other point from that sicko clip, HMOs, Health Maintenance Organisations, there's loads of acronyms. The one you need to remember is Integrated Care Systems. That's what they're calling it in this country. It's exactly the same. And the guy who's going to impose it, Simon Stevens, knows what he's doing. What is integrated care? What is a HMO? The American system, you have hospital providers who want to maximize profit, and they maximize profit by doing things you don't need, like heart surgery you don't need, because it's profitable. The insurers maximize profit by not paying out when you're sick and expensive. What if these two people get together and collude? That's what HMO is, yeah? So they align incentives to act against the patient's interest. The insurer says, look, if you save money, we'll give you half the surplus. You take a bit, we'll take a bit of the action, and the patient won't know anything about it. That's what Nixon was talking about. The less care you give them, the more money you make. And how are we going to do it in this country? It's called the NHS Long-Term Plan. Anybody heard about that? The document on the left is a, you can't see it, it's a document from United Health 2012 when Simon Stevens was still working for United Health. It has his name at the bottom of the document and it talks about a shared savings program. Near the bottom, shared savings program. Does that ring a bell with what Nixon was saying? Well, we've got a similar thing, but we like to change the name slightly. Shared savings scheme. January last year, my union, the British Medical Association, colluded with Health Education, NHS England, to ram through the biggest contract change since 1948 onto general practitioners who haven't got a clue about what's going on, without a vote of the members, to introduce American-style HMOs. And what the Shared Savings Scheme will do is incentivize your GP not to refer you when you need an operation if he's going to breach his targets. If I'm going to get a fine or lose out on an incentive for referring too many hip replacements, I might not refer them. I might say to you, your hip's not too bad. That operation's terrible, high risk. With your heart trouble, you better not go for the operation. Do you see how it works? So they are introducing very slowly perverse incentives for us, no longer to be the advocate for our patients, but to be actively harming our patients. Is there anybody here on a statin drug? Statin drugs are next to useless. If you have a heart attack, and you take statin drugs for five years religiously, 
How much longer do you think it will extend your life, sir? Most people say three or four years. That's fair enough, yeah? You're taking the tablet every night. Four days. Four days. Why? We have, through the use of guidelines and medical education, through drug company-sponsored trials, ended up poisoning millions of people because statins are very, not very pleasant drugs to take. Muscle pain, sleep disturbance, memory loss. That's an example of how perverse incentives, because we are rewarded through something called quality outcomes framework. The more people stat it, the cholesterol we get lower, we get a bit of a bonus. That's how they make us do what they want us to do. Anybody had a dementia screening test in this? No, I don't think you would have done. If you're over 65 and you go along to your GP, and you've gone for some other reason, but he pulls out a memory testing sh chart, he'll get 55 quid a shot for doing a dementia screen. You might say, well, what's wrong with that? I'll tell you what's wrong with it. It's a very poor test. It has a 40% false positive rate. That means 40% of the people who fail the test don't have dementia. Part of our core role is not to do harm and falsely labelling people with dementia is harmful. So you, just, you can see how these things are creeping in and eroding our clinical integrity and acting against the interest of the patient. And that's what the savings scheme will extend. Right, it was a good question. It was let slip in the 2017 election when Theresa May this dementia tax. The scam was that if you were labelled demented and you ended up in hospital and required long-term care, they can flog off your house to pay for your care. Yeah, it didn't make any other sense until that slipped out. What's this map? It's not very clear, but this is a map of the presence of United Health Optum in England, already running the back office administration and taking control of the budget. Now, it's worse than this. They've got the whole of London, they've got their personnel in key positions, they've got their man in the top job, they've got Hancock serving as some distraction, the public have got no clue about what's going on, 99% of the medical profession haven't got a clue, but they dominate NHS, England funding and funding flows. So how... Oh, running out of time, aren't I? How are we doing? Uh, you've got another 10, 10 minutes. Maybe. Okay. How are they going to seal the deal? What they are working on at the moment? And if you do nothing else, have a conversation with your GP at some point. They are destroying general practice. At the moment, a GP's income comes with his patient list. So I've got 5,000 patients. For every patient, let's say my practice gets 100 pound, right? So the budget stays with the list. What these reforms will do in, over time is to remove the list from the GP and put it with the network, primary care network, these new organizations. Once the primary care network has got control of the budget, you no longer need the GP. And if you see what's happened in Out of Hours GP Care, you've gone from a GP cooperative, so when you're sick you'd see a highly qualified person, to NHS Direct, a helpline run by nurses, to 111, a helpline run by school leavers. Right? That's going to be the same for the rest of general practice. So in a few years' time, for you to rock up to your GP and say, I need to see a doctor, no chance. The receptionist, who is untrained, will decide who you see. Whether you go and see a pharmacist, you go and see a physiotherapist, you go and see a physician's associate. GPs are not welcome. Doctors are not welcome in the new system because doctors tend to drive up costs because they want to look after the patient. Yeah? 
So the more doctors you can drive out of the system, the more money you can make. Yeah? This is called downskilling. Replace expensive staff with cheaper staff. What's the problem? The blind spot. If you're a GP, five years medical school, another five years after medical school, you don't know everything, but you know a little, a little bit about a lot of things, and you've got a small blind spot. The less qualified the person, the bigger blind spot. What does a blind spot mean? Patients dying. That's what the blind spot means. I'll give you an example. So you're a 23-year-old lady, you go to the GP, you say, I've got shoulder. I know who you need to see. You need to see our physiotherapist. Anybody disagree with that? Reasonable? Who said that? That's not fair. Nobody heard him. I'll explain it to you. A lady of that age presenting with shoulder pain could be related to internal bleeding, irritating the diaphragm, which shares the same nerve supply as your shoulder. So she could go to the physiotherapist and collapse on the floor and bleed to death. That's what de-skilling is all about. Increasing the risk to the patient, making more money for the private provider. Who's not depressed enough? <laughs> <laughs> so, what have I been working on? My, myself and a colleague of mine, Drew McFadden, we've been working for the last couple of years. We've produced a film which explains all of this. We've been to America. We've, we've also uncovered how their system works. And we reveal how we're going to get to the end game unless a lot more people like yourselves start to get active educate yourselves, educate others. Um, if you haven't got a card, there's some at the back and there's some at the front here. The film's called The Great NHS Heist. We need as much help as possible for people to spread the word. There's more you can do, you don't have to take my word for it. The books I've got up on the screen here are, will give you a very good picture. If you're going to only read two books, it would be the top two. The Plot Against the NHS, written four or five years ago, and Deadly Spin, which is, explains the corruption which is endemic within the American insurance industry, and the author we also interview in our film, Wendell Potter. Uh, Propaganda Blitz explains how corporate media is really there just to control people's understanding of the world. And Democracy in chain, Chains explains the transatlantic flow of dark money and think tanks and other um, outlets for their money, such as social media advertising and all that sort of thing, which I won't go into. So, I was watching something and listening to something on the way here. There's a man called Ralph Nader who stood for president in the mid-2000s in, in the States. He more or less single-handedly managed to introduce safety legislation in America in the 60s, car safety and environmental safety he pushed. And one thing he repeatedly says, in order to achieve change, you do not need 99% of the public to wake up. You need around 1% of dedicated people to make social change. And hopefully what I'm doing is giving you the equipment to be that 1%. Thank you very much. That was an absolute tour de force. It's a truly horrific and terrifying picture when you look at it. But don't forget that what you're looking at is the glory of free market enterprise. <laughs> Health is a peculiar topic, isn't it? We all feel we have a right to live. None of us do really, but we all feel that there shouldn't be a conspiracy to deny us basic healthcare that can facilitate a good and healthy life. But you know, Gordon Brown and Tony Blair, were, had a, they had a mantra here. They kept on talking about, and it, was a, and it is stature, isn't it? 
the beauty of the efficiency of the market, the efficiency of free market enterprise. When they talked about PPP, they didn't say we're going to make a killing, quite literally, but a killing in terms of profit for the big banks. They said, no, no, we're going to introduce the efficiency of the market into healthcare. And just as Nixon said, this is a, you know, one minute he's saying, this is great, we can make money and deny people health. And 24 hours later, 16 hours later, 18 hours later, he's on broadcasting to the American people, all of them, saying this is about excellent quality healthcare, and then blinking in that way that it makes you think he's absolutely lying. A bit like when Bill Clinton says, I didn't have sex with that woman. <laughs> and he walks off stage. Yeah? This is what it's all about. They're absolutely fraudulent. They lie to our faces. The British ruling class is supremely cynical. They know not to tell us the truth, and that with most people, their words will be taken at face value. So they never admit the lie. The free market, of course, is very efficient. It's very efficient in making profit for a tiny number of people. United Health have managed to take over most of our NHS, control a lot of the funding, direct more and more of the money their way. Who knows about it? If I tell that to my colleagues at work, they don't know about it. I direct them towards Bob's film. Some watch it, some don't. Few do. It's very hard to swallow and to accept but it's happening to us now. The free market is excellent at making money, but it can't make money out of the poor. Free market fundamentalist capitalism is excellent at making poor people. So that's the, they're in the rub. And there's actually billions of people, more than half the world's planet we know, have less wealth than the richest six individuals on earth. So those six individuals have got all the money and they're searching away around the world thinking, how can I make more money? But you can't make money out of the poor. They've got nothing you, more you can take from them. They're already marginalised enough. And that's the problem with the NHS. The NHS has got all this money, all this beautiful tax money, just at the time when people are looking for profitable investments. Of course we have to take advantage of it. But you don't waste so much of that money providing health care to the poor. You know, you can run health services and make a lot of money, providing you tailor your services, giving too much health care to the rich. It's something Bob didn't touch on this time, but there are instances literally of health care organisations giving unnecessary half operations. Perhaps proving that half the half operations they're delivering are unnecessary in the United States. They're taking people who don't need operations, subjecting them to major surgeries, massive, grievous bodily harm upon those people. So on the one hand, unnecessary, expensive care to people who don't need it. On the other hand, neglecting the health care of, literally, in our country, millions, and across the world, billions. But we don't hear about the 120,000 people who are dying on waiting lists because of the privatisation and cuts within the NHS. There's no headline. But there's wall-to-wall -wall headline about coronavirus, of which until yesterday there were no people suffering from that disease in this country. Because it's useful propaganda against China, and at times it's being a total distraction. And when you do hear it, you hear people pep up, of course the NHS is ready for any epidemic that comes. The NHS has run down to the point that Bob can't get people out of the surgery into the hospital. I have people on my waiting list that I can't get onto operating lists. I have people having second strokes waiting for their carotid endarterectomy. When I've diagnosed them, I know what I want to do to them. I just can't get them on a list in a timely fashion to have the operation done. You know, Andy, I'm not, we're not supposed to speak out about these things. People don't want to hear it. You can get yourself in trouble. Your career will suffer, your job will suffer. Well, it's time that we built an organisation that can put the case not for the very, very wealthy, but for the working people. I'm afraid that um, we're going to have to bring this session to a close quite quickly. We've only got 10 or 15 minutes probably before we're going to have to leave the hall. I'd like George to, to wrap up the session, but I don't want to stop before people have the chance to answer perhaps just one or two brief questions to Bob, because he's a mine of knowledge and information. You should see his film, Sell Off. You should see his film, The Great NHS Ice, if you haven't already. You should use them to disseminate this information because it's extremely powerful. And it should be a key part of the message that the Workers' Party of Britain is taking to the British people. Labour will not save your NHS any more than the Tories will. And it's not just about Boris selling it to Trump. This is something that's been happening over 40 years. It's very joined up and it's something that we need to be very explicit about. Um, so I'll take one question from that lady there.
you want to come here, Lord? I don't think there there won't be a magic flip over. It will be a grip. It will be a drift of the middle class out of the NHS, and you're talking of a drift over two or three years. They will certainly try and do as much of the structural change that's left to do in the early part of this parliament. And I think there's talk about um, legislating for under health inflation budgets for the NHS for the term of this parliament. So they want to put into law defunding the NHS. One slide I didn't show you, which is a worry, and I will show you because I think it's relevant, is what, is, what uh, Simon Stevens needs to do in order to pull the budgets. He needs to have a part of the Health and Social Care Act repealed, which is called Section 75. At the moment, perversely, Section 75 within the NHS it forces everything to be tendered out, but that's open and we can scrutinise it. By removing section 75, that will be done behind closed doors without public scrutiny. And the most perverse thing about it is look who Simon Stevens has got calling for the reversal or the scrapping of section 75. The GMB union, keep our NHS public, we own it, and a think tank called CHPI. The very organisations supposedly protecting the NHS are calling for a bit of the legislation to change which will enable American-style HMOs. You couldn't make it up. And that's why we all need to become a bit more informed about the detail. Last question, and then I'm going to hand it over. I'm going to ask uh, George to come to the stage and wrap up the meeting for us. Uh, anyone who hasn't asked a question before? Come uh, on. I was going to ask, like, prior to seeing this, to be honest, what can be the roles of the unions if there is hope in them at all in possibly combating them? So, uh, so the question uh, is, how can we fight this and do the unions have a role for? We need to arrange an exchange programme with the French unions. <laughs> and unfortunately, our health unions are captured. There's no other way to put it. They have significant funds, significant manpower, why aren't they putting this out? What's the problem? The problem is they're right wing of the Labour Party, aren't they? They're Blairite or they're ignorant. Either way, they're not doing a good job. But I think there's an important role for grassroots union members to put pressure on upward and challenge their, their, their local leaders and national leaders. Why aren't you telling us about this? It needs grassroots pressure upwards. And I think without that, they're a waste of time. Thank you, thank you so much. There's so much more to say about this. I think we'll revisit it in subsequent meetings, perhaps different aspects of it. But we have a little bit of time now, and I'd very much like to hand over to George Galloway, uh, our leader, to wrap up the meeting today. Please uh, give a round of applause to Bob. Seven to five to eight. <laughs> I literally have four minutes before we'll be thrown out, so I can't do justice to the devastating session that we've just had. Uh, you asked if we were depressed. I prefer the couplet from the Blessed Saint Augustine that you had on the screen. I feel anger and I feel courage having heard you anger at the crime that has been committed against our finest institution, anger at the Labour Party for its role in that, with majorities in the hundreds and a period in power of 
uh, more than a decade, 13 years, in which this whole process fastened, quickened. And anger at the shadow Secretary of State for Health, Mr. Ashworth, who spent most of his time in office conspiring against Jeremy Corbyn to try and get rid of him and was finally caught in a tape-recorded conversation with a Conservative, proving that which I had been saying for some years. Um, I hope that everyone has been impressed enough at least to follow us, follow us on Twitter, follow us through our website, follow the mother of all talk shows on Sundays. I hope some of you, I hope most of you, the great Clydeside leader Willie Gallagher used to open his meetings, comrades and friends, and I hope by the end of the meeting I don't have any friends left. That sometimes happens to me, but for other reasons. I hope that most of you will have concluded that there is a space, a place, a need for the Workers' Party of Britain and that you will join us. We'll shortly announce where our next public uh, event will be. We're going to do one of these kinds of meetings every month throughout the course of this year and we feel that there is a place for us. We feel that we have a perspective on things that is valuable, indeed vital, on small and large matters. We're looking for local government by-elections. We want all of you to descend on a small place somewhere where a council by-election is being fought, and we'll fight it there. There may be parliamentary by-elections, as Nai Bevan said, where there's death, there's hope. <laughs> But our primary purpose in this early period is not elections. It is building an organization of thousands of conscious, clear, and dedicated people. I hope that you are the first of those. Thank you very much for coming.